What's going on guys? Cody McBroom here with Tailored Coaching Method. Today I want to talk to you about nutrient timing. Nutrient timing is something that there's really two camps in the industry, in the coaching space. There's the camp that really loves nutrient timing and really believes in it. And then there's the camp that says calories are all that matter. It doesn't matter what your macros are. It doesn't matter what your nutrient timing is. It really doesn't matter anything at all as long as you're following your calories and hitting your calories by the end of the day. I think the reality of smart coaching and really good programming when it comes to a diet is that there's a gray area and we actually fall in between. There's always a balance to be had with these things and there's no rules written in stone. It's more like things written in sand and things are individualized across the board depending on who you are, what your goal is, and how you train. So first and foremost, what is nutrient timing? Nutrient timing is the act or periodization or strategy of shifting the timing of your nutrients. Pretty obvious, right? It's how we're planning our meals, we're planning our food, and we're planning when we are consuming specific nutrients, so a certain amount of carbs or a certain amount of protein or a certain amount of fat at a certain time relevant mainly to our training. Now we can use nutrient timing across the day, but most of the time when we're speaking about nutrient timing, we're talking about setting up our diet around the workout period. The next question we have to answer is, is it really that important? The big thing for us to remember and always focus on is the nutritional hierarchy, something that was first originally made by Eric Helms and has been later used in many different ways. It was in the book Fat Loss Forever, it was in the RP Diet 2.0, I've had my own versions of the hierarchy, and there's a lot of other coaches in the space that have used this as well, but it's a really good way of understanding the importance or the order of importance when it comes to dieting. So before we answer this question of is nutrient timing important, we have to look at the hierarchy and see where it falls on that. And if you see the hierarchy, it goes calories, macros, micronutrients, then meal timing and frequency, and then after that it's supplementation. So we we have to remember that overall calories do play a bigger role. Our actual individualized macronutrient intake plays a bigger role. Micronutrients and the quality of our food plays a bigger role. Meal timing comes after that. But the thing we have to remember as coaches and in a practical setting is that this hierarchy can be shifted and certain things can be focused on more so depending on where the client's at. For example, somebody like myself does not need to focus on micronutrients because I eat a really healthy diet and I have a lot of good food in my diet, a lot of whole food, minimally processed food. That's just my habit. So I don't have to think about that. So I place a better and a larger emphasis on meal timing because meal timing makes it easier for me to adhere to my daily intake and make sure I'm getting the right foods in. So for different people, meal timing kind of moves up and down with this pyramid, but in general, in theory, we have to remember that calories and macros do play a larger role than meal timing. Now, this doesn't mean that meal timing or nutrient timing is not important because this is quite literally how we are keeping satiation throughout the day and staying full. It's how well we are adhering to our total daily intake in the first place, which is the biggest role of fat loss or muscle growth. It is going to help us either perform better in the, tr in the gym or recover faster from the gym. So there's a lot of roles that this plays and that, that goes on to say things about energy throughout the day, uh, cortisol levels throughout the day, sleep quality. And if we look into something like chrononutrition, we're learning more and more about nutrient timing specifically to aid hormonal balance and sleep quality. Digestion plays a role. So there's a lot of reasons why nutrient timing actually plays a massive role. We just have to remember that it does fall later in the hierarchy, but that does not mean you shouldn't focus on it. Now, who is this applicable for? What I would say is if we're looking at this hierarchy, looking at calories, looking at macros, looking at micronutrients, meal timing and nutrient timing really is for anybody who has understood and got down the basics. If you have your calories in check, if you are hitting your macros on a regular basis, if you're filling most of your diet, about 80 to 90% of your diet with minimally processed whole foods, then you have every right to focus on nutrient timing because it's going to improve your training and your recovery. And if we, and we improve our training and recovery, we are improving our stress levels, we are improving the results we get from the gym, and we are improving the results we see with our body because of that. So although you changing the timing of your nutrients isn't gonna immediately show you reward, over time, everything around it improves because of it being more on point. So in hindsight, this is for anybody, not just athletes who have already mastered or at least got down the basic fundamentals of calorie intake, macronutrients, and eating quality food. Now, let's get into actual applicable context. How many meals a day should you be eating? The reality of this is simple. You can eat two meals, three meals, four meals, five meals, six meals. If your daily calories are equated for, meaning you are hitting your calories and you are hitting your macros, specifically protein, 
It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, your results will be the same. And this has been shown in countless studies. However, what I would say is most of these studies are probably not done on bodybuilders or people looking to get shredded or people looking to build as much muscle as possible or looking at tracking their biofeedback and seeing how their digestion, their energy, their fatigue, their sleep, and all these different things play a role. We also have studies that show things with glycogen replenishment, cortisol reduction, based on nutrient timing, muscle hypertrophy, based on nutrient timing, chrononutrition, based on nutrient timing. So there's definitely studies that go both ways. But at the end of the day, it's less about how many meals you have and just making sure that you're getting enough nutrients. Now, what I will say from years of experience in coaching is that two or three meals a day typically isn't enough to make sure that you're avoiding under eating and you're actually getting enough protein. I mean, for an average individual who is 150 pounds, which is not a heavy individual, you have to consume about 150 grams of protein. That means 50 grams of protein per meal. That's not always easy to do and can leave your digestion feeling stressed or bloated after a meal. So sometimes it's better to increase that to four or five meals a day. And in my experience, it tends to be four or five meals a day that leads to the best energy, best digestion, and the best quality results possible. The next part of this is how far apart should these meals be? My typical recommendation is anywhere between three to five hours. After about three to five hours, we start to see the muscle protein synthetic response Response from eating a high protein meal start to decline. Because of that, we wanna eat protein again and let that protein synthesis, MPS, increase again because the more often we can increase that and have that fluctuating number, the more likely we are to recover and build more muscle tissue. Three to five hours is also enough time to actually digest the meal before. So if you're only taking an hour or two between meals, you probably haven't even finished utilizing and digesting the nutrients you just took in from the last meal. So in my experience and my recommendation, splitting up your meals four to five times a day between three to five hours apart is typically the best route to take. And at the end of the day, you will finish eating and have a solid 10 to 12 hours from your last meal of the day to your first meal the next day. The next part to discuss with this is peri-workout nutrition. Peri-workout nutrition is literally just the idea of setting up your nutrients around your workout. And this is gonna be the most important time. If we wanna stop right here, what we could say is that if you make sure that you have a really good pre-workout meal and post-workout meal, the other meals don't really matter that much as long as you hit calories. So macros and calories can kind of fluctuate and you can just eat however you want within your calorie intake in those other meals as long as your pre and post workout are optimized, specifically pre, because I would argue that the pre-workout meal is actually more important than the post-workout meal based on a lot of research showing that there is no anabolic window where we require to rush to a post-workout shake or anything after our training. That being said, I will get onto later how you can optimize those other meals to have a perfect day of eating. But first, let's talk about the pre-workout meal, which in my opinion is the most important meal of the day. This is the meal that fuels us for the training session before. It provides us with not only glycogen to train, but also increases blood glucose, which allows us to perform better in the gym, increasing ATP, which is a fuel source, increasing blood glucose and hydration and, and muscle fuel, literally, so we can actually have a better pump and perform better in the gym, and that leads to a better recovery rate because we have those nutrients in our body. Add to that, we need protein in this meal to make sure that our muscle protein synthesis and breakdown balance are on point. This is gonna lead to better muscle growth and better muscle recovery so that we're not beating ourselves into the ground. So how do we do this? The best way to do this is to first and foremost have about 25 to 40 grams of protein in that single setting. This is kind of a big range, but 25 grams is just barely above the minimum amount to really spike muscle protein synthesis because that gives us enough leucine in a single dose, which is amino acid that is a precursor and an anabolic signal for muscle growth. 40 grams or more is when we start pushing the lines of like, there's no real added benefit to consuming more than this. If you're a very large individual, you might be eating 45 or 50 grams, but in general, 20 to 40, specifically 25 to 45, is probably the best range to stick in. The more calories you have, the more protein you can take in a day, the larger that number can be. If you can, in a perfect world, I would suggest splitting these up into casein and whey protein sources. This is kind of splitting hairs, but there is some good research that shows that a casein protein will actually digest a little bit slower. This would be something like cottage cheese, Greek yogurt, or casein protein powder. This slower digestion is less insulogenic and it delays muscle protein breakdown because it takes longer for those amino acids to get into the bloodstream. The problem with that is that it's not fast acting protein, which we do need as well. But if you combine the casein with whey, the whey can act as the fast fast acting protein source which spikes muscle protein synthesis higher, but the casein will last longer and provide a 
delay of the muscle protein breakdown. So if we combine these two things, and what I actually like to do is I take Greek yogurt and Top Notch Nutrition's whey protein, I put them together. Now I have a casein protein and a whey protein together to give me a good ratio of both 20 grams in each, and that provides the muscle protein synthetic response I need while limiting muscle protein breakdown. The next point we have to make is carbohydrates. With carbohydrates, you typically wanna consume anywhere between 0.75 to 1.5 grams per kilogram. This is a big range, but I have individuals who are consuming 500 grams of carbs a day. Sometimes you have to eat about 1.5 grams per kg per kilogram of body weight in that meal and carbs. But for a lot of people, 0.75 to one gram per kilogram is totally fine. For me personally, I'm about 78 kilograms in weight, which means I need at least 65 to 70 grams of carbs in that first meal. I typically eat about 100 grams before I work out about three hours prior. The next part of this is actually splitting these nutrients up between starch and fructose. So glucose and fructose. If we eat a starch, a starch is primarily glucose. And this is gonna be a great source of muscle glycogen because that's the best nutrient to store in the muscle cell as glycogen to fuel our performance. This is gonna come in the form of oats, rice, potatoes, things that are starchy carbs in nature. Fructose on the other side, which is fruit, is going to be predominantly for the liver, but also gonna have a little bit of an effect on uh, blood glucose levels. But the cool thing here is that our body has multiple glucose transporters. And what that means is that we have different systems essentially to digest and absorb these nutrients. So if we combine starch and fructose, so glucose and fructose, starch and fruit, we can actually utilize multiple glucose transporters and get more carbohydrates into the cell faster and more efficiently to train harder, be better uh, prepared for our training and recover faster, and utilize more carbs in a small setting. And there's a lot of studies that actually show combining different sources of carbohydrates will speed up the rate of digestion and absorption of carbohydrates. So instead of just having oats, have oats and blueberries. Instead of just having rice, have an apple or banana on the side. The point being is that you have a total of 0.75 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of carbohydrates, and about 80 to 90% of those carbohydrates are from a starch, from glucose. The other 10 to 20% is from a fruit, fructose. And this combination is going to better fuel you for your training. The last thing we have to talk about is fats. How much fat should you have in the pre-workout meal? I typically like to keep this pretty low. We're gonna have anywhere between five to 15 grams on average. There's some people who can handle more, some people can handle less, and the further away from your training you are, the less you should have. But the point being is you don't wanna completely eliminate fats because fats slow the digestion down a little bit and avoid getting hyperglycemic where we have too many carbs with no fat and such a fast digestion rate that we kind of just bonk. So to, to avoid that, having good protein helps, but also having a little bit of fat, usually like I said, at least five grams, but upwards of 15 grams, gives you enough to slow that digestion down, keep you satiated, avoid that hyperglycemic response, and it's not so much that you feel really bogged down or like you're digesting a lot of calories during your training session, which is really, really important. So at the end of the day, we have anywhere between 25 to 45 grams of protein pre-workout. Ideally a combination of casein and whey. We have about 0.75 to 1.5 grams per kilogram of carbohydrates with a combination of 80 to 90% glucose or starch, 10 to 20% fructose or fruit. And then last but not least, we have about five to 15 grams of fat, which is just enough to slow the digestion down, but not enough to cause any digestive issues. Next, we have post-workout. The reality of post-workout is it's actually not as important as most people believe. And, and over the years, we used to think it was super, super important. In fact, it was the most important meal of the day. You had to sprint out to your car and drink a protein shake before you lost your gains because there was this magic anabolic window 30 minutes after your workout that you could consume protein and you would aid muscle recovery and build more muscle. The reality here is that the most optimal window is probably more like three hours. And realistically, you're not gonna lose any muscle if you extend that to six plus hours. What I recommend for people to do is really just make sure you have a meal planned. You don't need to rush to your car. You don't need to rush to anything. You just need to go home, cook a meal, and eat within three hours. This meal should be primarily Protein and carb, you can have any type of protein source really, should be lower fat and fiber because we do want to speed digestion up for two reasons. Number one, the faster we can get nutrients into the system post-workout, the more likely we can spike insulin and drop cortisol. Insulin and cortisol have an inverse relationship, meaning that when insulin is spiked, cortisol declines, and cortisol is a stress-based hormone. If we can lower cortisol post-workout, we'll be more likely to recover properly and actually build more muscle or lose fat because the stress hormone is lower. So it is 
optimal to get to a meal relatively quickly post-workout, but you don't need to rush to do it. We do want to have less fat and fiber so that digestion rate is faster, the insulin spikes harder, we get that cortisol down and we get the muscle glycogen to be replenished more rapidly. So typically what I recommend here is any protein source, again, looking for at least 25 grams, but upwards of 45 is totally fine. About the same amount of carbs that you had pre-workout, or more if you have room in your caloric intake. You can also have a combination of fruit and starch if you want, but at least having that starch, and I would recommend some kind of salt because that salt's gonna help with the replenishment, electrolytes, and even your thyroid health along the way. All right, the last thing to consider is just the other meals in the day. Like I said before, if you get your pre-workout mastered, your post-workout is pretty optimal. The rest of the meals don't matter too much as long as you're hitting your nutrients. But what I typically recommend that people do is take the rest of their calories and macros and just split them up evenly across the day. So if you still have 60 grams of protein left and you wanna eat three more meals, each of those meals should have 20 grams. If you only have two other meals in the day, those those meals would each have 30 grams of protein. If you have 60 carbs, same exact thing. You could split that into three 20 gram carb servings or two 30 gram carb servings. And the same applies with fat. So if we sit here and we map out our pre-workout meal to be optimal for performance, we get a good post-workout meal that gives us protein and starch with low fat and fiber. And then we just set it up so the rest of our nutrients are split up evenly across those other meals. We are gonna be in a position where optimal digestion is, is really mastered and we're starting to feel better on an internal basis. Digestion improves, sleep improves, and oftentimes if we have these meals in a system and we're repeating them at the same time in the same frequency on a daily basis, we actually see an in increase in insulin sensitivity, which helps with storage of carbohydrates, and we see an increase in energy expenditure, which means you actually burn more calories per day if you just stick to your meal frequency. It doesn't mean that four meals burns more than three, it just means that if you were consuming four, keep consuming four, because that will lead to greater energy expenditure. So to recap all of this, pre-workout is most important. We want low fat, high carb, high protein with a combination of fruit and starch in that meal. Post-workout, we want very similar, but a little bit less fat and fiber to make sure that we get immediate digestion versus pre-workout when we want a slightly slower digestion rate. And then the rest of our meals, we're just splitting up our nutrients evenly, deciding on a meal frequency that works for us, and we're sticking to that day in and day out to make sure that we are getting the most out of our diet. Guys, if you like these videos, make sure you please do me a huge favor. Share it with a friend if they could use this knowledge. Like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel if you are not already. And if you want more information about what we do and how we do it, go to tailoredcoach.com.